Now, let's get an independent analysis of just what's been agreed at Glasgow and whether it will be enough to limit the catastrophic effects of climate change. Professor Sadita Helm is a professor of energy policy and economics at Oxford University. Last week, the... Uh, so I beg your pardon. Uh, let me... Let me... Uh, uh, talk to you, Professor uh, Helm, before I go on to anybody else. Um, COP26, progress or just more, to use the cliché, blah, blah, blah? Well, it's a bit more of the latter than the former. If the objective at COP26 was to keep 1.5 degrees alive, it's dead. Uh, even if for the first time ever, every country does everything that it promised to do, uh, we won't uh, be able to achieve 1.5. And I think it's important to recognise that after 30 years of COPs, one after the other, in every single year for the last 30 years, we've nevertheless added two parts per million of carbon to the atmosphere. No breaks, no hesitations every year, including even last year during the lockdowns. So if you ask the question, is COP26, you know, the turning point, all the rhetoric that was trotted out before, um, as before all previous COPs, the answer is no. It tells you this isn't going to happen. And there's a very good reason for that which is that there is this illusion that, you know, climate change is going to be solved in the UK. If only we do stuff here, it's going to be fine. We're going to be world leaders and we're going to crack it and therefore not avoid, uh, therefore avoid the costs, as Ed Miliband said, of climate change. No, the truth is that the future of, of climate in this world will be largely determined in places like China, India, sub-Saharan Africa, in the rainforests and so on. And if you look at this summit, even in the voluntary pledges, the key players are not at the table. And the 80% fossil fuels, which are the mix of our energy in the globe now, there's no plan to go from 80% fossil fuels to naught globally. Indeed, that's starkly absent from the discussions at Glasgow. So let's not so, be so deluded what... this solves, solves the problem. It certainly doesn't. So what was the point of the last two weeks? You make it sound like it was just a complete waste of time. No, no, it's very good that people talk. It's very good that people are educated about what's going on. But it's not good to believe that these great summits are the crunch point that's going to turn the globe. That isn't what these things are about. And if we really seriously want to get in the game of no longer causing climate change, we have to get the metrics right. So it's not whether you produce steel in Britain that counts as opposed to import it. It's that there is steel in our mix, territorial carbon emissions. You can get those down by closing down the steel industry if that's what you want to do. What matters is our carbon consumption, our carbon footprint. And that's part of trade. That's about carbon border adjustments. That's about carbon pricing. All the stuff that wasn't discussed at COP is absolutely critical to proper engagement so you and I can genuinely say we are no longer causing climate change. Let's come back to some of those, uh, if you like, other factors, but just dealing with what COP itself dealt with, afforestation or, or the, I think the slogan now is cash, cars, uh, trees and so on. Um, can you make an estimate, there are various numbers flying around, but can you make an estimate uh, of what uh, temperature rise we're headed for, given the promises that were made yesterday, if they were all fulfilled, where would we be? Well, the, the best estimate in the public domain is the 1.8 to 2.4. And my guess is it's much closer to 2.4 than it is to 1.8. And um, that is really serious. That's a, a, a dramatic uh, change which is going to happen in this century and affect all of us. Um, and when we look at you know, how we affect that, which is how we persuade the developing world not to go down the route that we've gone down in the developed world, you know, core to this is, well, how are we gonna help them do it? After all, we put most of the stuff up in the atmosphere. What's our contribution? Well, let's look at what our contribution is. The amount to be spent private and public 
on dealing with the great disaster of the uh, destruction of the rainforests in places, especially like the Amazon, is less than we wasted on track and trace in this country. The 100 billion, which we've never lived up to in the past, is a bit more than the annual dividend of Saudi Aramco and uh, quite small compared with what we spent in 18 months in this country on coronavirus. These are the sorts of orders of magnitude which tell you the difference between the brave words and what really needs to be done to help uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, indeed even China, address what is the major source of future emissions and the major source of damage to our rainforests and so on. I want to come back to what you think should be done, but just paint a picture for us of, that, of the consequences of that 2.4 degrees that you uh, mentioned a moment ago? Well, there are two answers to that question. There's the obvious one, which is that a hotter world is genuinely going to be bad for most countries around the world and worse for some rather than others. Uh, as to the exact effects, this assumes that we know precisely how to model the world's climate with, say, two, three degrees of warming in it. And that's not true. It's very complicated as to how higher temperatures affect all sorts of things, from weather patterns right through to uh, the tundra and so on, whether it triggers dramatic changes like the release of methane from the Arctic. So I think the honest answer is we don't know precisely, but there are no suggestions that it's going to be a good thing and quite a lot of suggestions it's going to be a bad and perhaps very bad thing. Uh, let, let me put an alternative point of view to the one that you've been putting to me. Um, the Prime Minister says that Britain's well on its way to net zero and we don't need a hair shirt to achieve it. Wouldn't it be lovely if cakeism really was true? But you can have all the smarties and it isn't going to cost you anything at all. Let's be straightforward about this. We're taking a carbon-intensive economy and in... Uh, 14 years, we want to get rid of 75% of emissions. And in 29 years, we want to get rid of virtually all of them. And you tell me, oh, it isn't going to cost you very much. Now, um, in your previous interview with Ed Miliband, he was careful to say that the costs are less than the costs of no, not acting. That's an admission there are a lot of costs. And we should be honest. You should tell the truth. You know, if you've got to take your boiler out, if you've got to change the way you drive, if you've got to change all that stuff in your carbon diary every day of the stuff you consume, if you've got to do all that lot, the idea that, you know, we're living beyond our carbon means, we're not paying for the pollution we cause, that suddenly we're going to pay for the pollution we cause, and by the way, the price is going to be zero. This is nonsense. And the way to think about it is to think what the carbon price would have to be to hit the target which, by the way, would be one of the most efficient ways of getting there. It's not naught. So there are substantive costs out there. There is going to have to be some change on the demand side in our lifestyles, as well as change on the supply side. But, you know, hoping the technological troops are coming down the hill rapidly to save the day, you know, 29 years away is not really long enough for much technical change. You know, we've got to do okay. it with what we've got. And 235... So what new technology do you think will be on the system in 235 that's not on the system today, which is going to make a substantive difference? Not a lot. OK. P Professor, let, let me lastly just put um, this, this to you. Uh, it's all very well, uh, politicians would say, for the professor of this, that and the other at Oxford University to describe the perfect scenario and tell us we've got it all wrong but you don't have to sell this to voters who are going to have to pay. This is unrealistic politically, isn't it? Yeah, I completely agree with you, right? And what that tells you is, it's not that our politicians are come some kind of villain of the peace. It's not that our politicians don't understand the nature of this problem. They do. The point is that you and me, the public, don't want to pay the cost. So if you ask the public, would you like to do something about climate change? They get it. That's, uh, and Glasgow has really helped in that process. They really understand this is a really serious problem. Uh, no doubt about it. The opinion polls show that. If you ask them, would you like to pay? 
or would you like cheaper regional air flights? Um, or, or, or would you like um, uh, you know, to have airports further subsidized? Would you like not to pay extra fuel duty? That's also yep. one. And what it tells you is okay. why climate change is so hard to crack is that actually we, and it's ultimately you and me that consume this stuff, the polluters, don't actually want to pay. And you know that's a nasty political reality which has to be confronted. But just simply giving people what they want and telling them that they can have cakeism, that isn't leadership. That doesn't help. This is a really serious problem and we need to get okay. on. Professor Helm, thank you very much indeed.